Bye. All right. Welcome, everybody. My name is Brenda Little. I'm the chairwoman of the LCCC Board of Trustees. And on behalf of the Board of Trustees, welcome to our final interview of the six with our sixth candidate for uh, interim president, Howard Major. There's Howard down at the end of the table. I'm sure many of you know Howard. To reiterate what I've said many times, Wyoming law states that a community college board shall appoint a chief administrative officer of the community college. And LCCC and the board, the board of trustees at LCCC takes that challenge very seriously. And we want to find the best interim president for this community college. We want to find the best person for faculty, staff, students, and administration and of course the community that elected us. So we feel that we need your help and your input in making a good decision. And so we have invited folks to participate or at least listen in on the formal interviews and then participate in the public forum. You should all have a score sheet that is green in front of blue. I always have to look at Archie and she keeps me straight off the covers. It is blue. Public forum one is green. Yellow. Yellow. No, it's yellow. <laughs> the questions are green. Yeah. Yay. Okay. You have a blue score sheet. Please uh, score the, the answers to our 10 questions. And please take the time, if you can, to write comments on the back of that score sheet. After the interview this afternoon, we will be collecting those score sheets. Please turn them in to a board member. That would be me, or John Kaiser, or Ed Mosier, or Kevin Kilty, or Carol Merrill over there. We are the board members who are present this afternoon. Any board member can take those. We will consolidate and we will collect and consolidate those score sheets and comments. And then we will look at your scores and comments along with those of the interview committee who are sitting at this table. <coughs> We will take your comments and scores into consideration and advisement as we analyze the, the candidates and how they did in their interviews and public forums. And then we as a board will have an executive session on February 2nd after a study session. And at that executive session, we will make a decision whether to offer the position to one of our six candidates or whether to start the process all over again. We take your score sheets and comments very seriously. So. Please take the time to fill those out and turn them into a board member. Please know, however, that the final decision as to who will be the interim president of Laramie County Community College is up to the board to make that decision. Uh, so please, please help us with that. The score sheets that you fill out will be made available to the public. We're going to find a, a repository for them where folks can look at them if they would like. So you can put your name on your score sheet or not depending on whether you want to be identified when somebody looks at the score sheets. Alex Barker, the president of ASG, is asking all of our questions this afternoon. And so, Alex, please take it away. Thank you, Brenda. Question one. Laramie County Community College is interested in the quality of their program. Give us an example of a time when you became aware of deficiencies in program quality at a college where you were employed and how you fixed the problem. Okay, uh, I'm going to answer the direct question, and then I'd like to fill in a little bit of background in addition to that. I'm conscious of the fact that we only have an hour and about six minutes of questions, so I'll try to be concise. But in answering the question, I was hired in 1999 at Glen Oaks Community College in southern Michigan, just over the Indiana border. And I was hired as assistant dean of instruction with the challenge of uh, handling telecourses which is distance learning and all distance learning, and the Learning Resources Senate. And before the interview, uh, I was told that the telecourses needed some special attention. When I got there, I found out that was an understatement. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with telecourses. Typically, those are purchased from a large producer, a telecourse producer, uh, Adult Learning Satellite Service, Dallas Community College used to produce those. And the video quality is very high on those. Some of you may be familiar with Cosmos, with Carl Sagan, who uh, did the, the telecourse. That's an example of the video quality that they had in the telecourses. 
So I came in expecting that that's what they were doing at that college. Turns out that's not what they were doing. What they were doing is videotaping the teachers in the classroom, putting them all on tapes, giving them out to students, and calling them telecourses. Now, they didn't even have a video operator in the back of the room. They just set up the video camera. So when the teacher would walk off camera, sometimes you'd have 15 minutes of looking at a chalkboard. And you could sometimes hear what was going on, and sometimes you couldn't. Well, we looked at the data, and the successful completion rates for the students was like between 10 and 15 percent of the students who took these telecourses successfully completed. We also took a look at the satisfaction surveys from the students, and they were horrible, as you can imagine. So uh, it was clear we needed to do something else. They didn't have any other form of distance learning at this college, although at this time in 1999, two-way interactive television was emerging, and every college in Michigan did have a two-way interactive television classroom, including this one, but this one was sitting unused. Um, they also were beginning in many colleges to offer online courses, but they had not done that yet at Glen Oaks. So the first thing I did was convene a telecourse committee, a distance learning committee, and we looked at uh, all the options, and and we took some site visits to a couple other colleges. I'm a firm believer that this is one of the best things you can do is go to a college that has a program that's operating effectively, let your people talk to their counterparts at that college and see what's working and why it's working and, and get a real feel for the day-to-day -day operation. So we went to Schoolcraft College near Livonia uh, and a couple other colleges in Michigan and we got a good feel for not only what a telecourse should look like, but also what an online course uh, could look like. And they came back and decided that they wanted to move to online and they wanted to do the video telecourses that were the kind that you purchased that had the really high video production quality. They didn't want to stay with the shooting their classroom instructor method. So that was, uh, I was pleased to hear that decision of the committee, by the way. So we then begin to implement, we followed a quality process implementation procedure uh, that was formulated by W. Edwards Deming, and uh, who's from Wyoming, by the way, grew up in Powell, Wyoming, and went to the University of Wyoming, and became kind of the quality expert for manufacturing quality around the world, not only in America, but around the world. So he had a, a way of implementing new programs called PDSA, you plan the program, you implement the program on a small scale, you study the results by looking at your data, and then you make adjustments and, and do the cycle again. Interestingly enough, many people call this the Deming cycle, but originally it was originated by John Dewey, an educator, so it really came out of education. So we implemented that process, and we put in uh, distance learning courses, uh, we put in two courses that were the telecourses that we purchased and licensed the rights to use with high video quality and we put in two that were online and we studied the results at the end. We found out the satisfaction level from students went up. Uh, the completion rate was in the 60s in the percent for the first time, which we thought was pretty good by comparison to the 10 to 15 percent, but we were continually adjusting that and we ended up then adjusting, we put a couple hybrid courses in or blended the two models. So we put in uh, the telecourse tapes with the discussion sessions held online. So uh, we kind of adapted uh, a third model that we thought worked well for our college. So that was the answer there. The addendum I wanted to add was when I was at Jackson Community College in Jackson, Michigan, that was one of the colleges that became a leader in implementing quality in education. And we actually got to go to a Deming workshop, which was a five-day workshop on continuous quality improvement. That Deming did everything himself for eight hours for five days at the age of 88 years old. So, uh, and it was really high quality stuff. It was wonderful. And so we got to see Deming and we got to go back and implement a lot of quality programs. So I had 10 years at Jackson Community College and about eight of those, we were implementing quality. Uh, we had 32 colleges. We were one of 32 colleges that formed a group called the Continuous Quality Improvement Network. And from that, and we met in Chicago, 
And many of the people who actually developed AQIP were uh, attendees at those meetings that we have from CQIN. So I feel like I've been in, involved with the quality movement for many years. I feel like that, that's a real strength of mine. Question two. Organizational executives often delegate broad authority to subordinates. Suppose you had authorized someone to fix a particular problem and this person kept reporting progress on getting that problem fixed, but you were unable to determine if the situation was actually improving. How would you go about assessing progress on the problem? If it turned out that there was no progress, what would you do then? Well, I think the president needs to be a hands-on president. In a college this size, I don't think a hands-on president delegates and then walks away from the problem and has nothing to do with it. I think the president helps to formulate a team and is a member of a team that would include some people who are closest to the problem and who really understand it. If it's a problem in instruction, that would mean faculty members. If it's a problem in student services, mean the people who are directly implementing the services. So whatever it was, you get the people who are closest to the problem on the team. You get the mid-managers on the teams, the deans, the vice president, and the president, and you look at the data and you determine whether there really is a problem. And at a college this size, you've got data, you've got information. If you don't have data, it doesn't take too long to collect data and, and get, like I said, you've got uh, uh, student surveys and you've got other ways to determine if there really is a problem. So if you decide there really is, then you can use some systematic process for your team to implement uh, improvements in that. And again, you set more times to collect data. Deming used to have a saying, he said, in God we trust, all others must have data. <laughs> and I think that's appropriate. I think you're going to take the data in the beginning and have baseline data. You're going to follow it as you go along and monitor the situation. You're going to stay on top of it. And then you're, you're not going to be relying on one person to tell you whether the problem is being fixed or not because it's going to be evident to you whether you're making progress or not. So at that point, if you find you're not making progress, the PDSA cycle is repeated, you would make adjustments and you continue on with this. Um, there's a couple other things about this question that I thought about. One is that I know that it's good news travels up, typically. Bad news doesn't travel up as well. People want to report to their superordinates that things are good. So they want to make the case that everything is good. So. That's, that's human nature, so if you're relying on somebody to do that, you, you need to be aware of that. And what is it where they say with the arms inspections, trust but verify? And I think that's a, another aspect to it. If you, you can look at the data yourself and you can verify, but I think a good president will surround themselves uh, with people who are willing and able to tell them the truth even if they know it's not what the president really wants to hear. And a president should let them know that that is important to him or her, that they tell them the truth, even if it's a difficult truth, and reinforce that, because when the bad news comes then, that we work together to solve it, and I'm not going to be there ready to blame you for something. So there's all those elements come into play. I also read into the question that there was a uh, possible element of, of misrepresentation, intentional misrepresentation. I, don't, I think that is unusual. I think it's more of a, a good news travels up better than bad news kind of thing most of the time. But if it was intentional <coughs> misrepresentation, then you've got a personnel problem, and that's a different problem. Then you deal with that with personnel and progressive discipline and personnel um, strategy. Question three. Tell us about the time in your career when a whole department in your organization needed to be restructured. How did you handle that situation? Okay, when I went to work at Jackson Community College, I was hired as director of the Learning Resources Center. And after about four years, I was promoted to associate dean of instruction. And a couple years after that, I was promoted to dean of occupational education. Uh, the dean of occupational education worked with the workforce development to make sure that we were meet, meeting the needs of employers who lived in our district and who hired our graduates. So I went out and visited the employers and asked them how satisfied they were with our graduates and with our programs. 
And they told me, well, the graduates are okay. They're not great, they're okay. They could use some improvement in some areas. But the biggest problem is that your programs are not available to us at a time schedule that where we can send people to them. You schedule your classes on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at times that are convenient for you, but they're not convenient for us. And we uh, were a little bit surprised to hear that. We never really thought that much about when we had our tech program scheduled. And these are programs like Millwright, Industrial Electricity and Electronics, um, Programmable Logic Controllers, Machine Tool, things like this that where the people went directly to work for employers. This wasn't the first two years of a four-year degree. These were direct to work kinds of positions and programs so that I was supervising at that time. So I went back and met with the department and said we need to look at the options. And we got together and looked at how different colleges were handling that. Again, I'm a big believer in if somebody has figured this out somewhere else, you know, the case method, copy and steal everything. We don't have to reinvent it on our own if somebody else has figured it out. So we found that several colleges had dealt with this successfully. Hennepin College in Minnesota, Francis Tuttle in Oklahoma, uh, Kellogg Community College right in our own backyard. And because they were in our own backyard, nobody wanted to visit them, of course. But, um, and Milwaukee Area Technical College. So we did some site visits and we went down there and my faculty was originally very negative about the idea of a flexible schedule. It would, it would change their, for teaching five classes of, uh, per semester, three hours each, to being in the lab for 30 hours a week and developing curriculum for another five hours a week. So they were a little skeptical about that big change. But we went out there to Francis Tuttle and my faculty walked up and said, this doesn't work, does it? He said, what doesn't work? He said, this open entry, open exit, flexible schedule stuff. He said, it works great, we love it. <laughs> And so, talking to their counterparts was much more effective than anything I could say to them and anything they could read in the literature. And we did that three different site visits and we actually did them all in one loop. And by the time we got back, we were uh, tired of talking to people about those things, but like you are tired of listening to these questions being answered. But nevertheless, it was definitely uh, worthwhile. And we put in this flexible open entry, open exit schedule we modularized the program. We had a Dakin workshop. We invited all the industry people in to tell us what should be in the curriculum, what sequences should be in, what, what are all the skills that a millwright needed, what are all the skills that a person operating a program, a logic controller needed, and they numbered them one to 150 or however many modules there were. We put them in sequence, and when the students came in, and we did some diagnostic testing to find out where they should start in sequence. Now we could handle the training and the retraining from those employers, not just the training, but the retraining of the people who are already working in the field. So if they wanted to cross train and make their machinists able to do enough electricity and electronics, so if the machine broke down and it was electrical, the machinists could work on it, didn't have to sit and wait for somebody for eight hours to show up to fix a, a simple problem. They wanted to cross train, they could have their machinists come in, take the electricity and electronics modules. It was so successful in the end that Michigan developed a series of technical, uh, basically units that went with the colleges called MTEX, and they funded it as long as the people would agree to do open entry, open exit. So it, it did work out. It was a big change. There were two that were never happy with it and, and opted to do something else for a living. But the, they're all their classes, I found out, were scheduled in the evening and they had a full-time other job during the day. So it was, uh, you can see why they were not too thrilled, too thrilled with the idea of switching to a 30 hours a week. And I can give you more detail about how that program was structured, but I think that's the essence of what you were after. But it was, again, the site visits, the working with them to help me develop the new plan, the data that we were getting, that we were building on, from, the, from our, the voice of the customer, as we call it. In this case, the customers were employers. And we also listened to the students who also liked the flexibility. Uh, and if you'd like more detail on how the actual program operated, I can provide that. Question. 
question four. What is your idea of the proper relationship between a college president and a board of trustees? It's a complex relationship with many aspects to it. The first one is employer-employee relationship. The board is the employer. They hire the president. They supervise the president, monitor the president. They evaluate the president. So it's an employer-employee relationship. Having said that, there's also times when they're a team, and it's a communication factor that they need to be communicating very well with one another. And in the spirit of, of that kind of communication, uh, and sometimes that kind of communication occurs and sometimes it doesn't. I remember one college where I worked where we noticed that the percent of our successful completers was the lowest in the state. Uh, we noticed that of the people who enrolled in the percentage who actually ended up with a degree or a certificate was lower than anywhere else in the state. And I expressed to a fellow administrator that that was a big concern. And he said, boy, let's, we better hope the board doesn't see that data. So it's the idea of that you can't have a partial communication. You have to have the president tipping the board members off if he sees things coming down the road so the boards don't get, board members don't get surprises. And you have to have the board members, if they hear things in the community, giving the president an opportunity to look into it before they make decisions based on um, what they're hearing in, in one part of the campus. So there's that mutual trust that has to exist. Then there's something called uh, policy uh, governance. And one of the biggest proponents in the nation for policy governance is George Potter. It happens that George Potter was the chairman of the board where I worked for 10 years at Jackson Community College. And I heard George talk about policy governance and how the board would only be concerned with policy and the staff would do everything else. And let me tell you, George talked about policy governance, but he didn't follow policy governance. Because when he got back to his uh, college, his own college, he was very active in the college. And he wasn't limiting himself to policy governance. So let me put it this way. It's, it's a nice ideal to say that the board is only responsible for policy. But the board has responsibilities to the community and to the students as well. And has to be involved if they, if they hear that there is an issue or a potential problem, but the trust relationship is built when the board communicates to the president, gives the president an opportunity to deal with it first. And, uh, and then the president has the responsibility for reporting accurately back to the board, and keeping the lines of communication open. So those are elements of the relationship as I see it. Question five. Tell us about a time that you had to improve the image of the college where you worked. What actions did you take and what was the result? Same college, Jackson Community College built a uh, campus. And in Michigan, before you can build a college, you have to get uh, the taxpayers in that county have to approve a millage. They have to agree to tax themselves uh, to build the college. And the taxpayers in Jackson County voted to do that. Uh, Nobody asked where the college was going to be built, and nobody said it wasn't going to be built downtown. And probably people assumed it was going to be built downtown because the community colleges around there were downtown colleges. When the college was built, it was built about 10 miles south of town. You go by the Guernsey herd, by the Holstein herd, and, and then you get to the college. It was out there, and the community was enraged. The community was so angry. It's, I went to work there 14 years after that had happened. And that's the first thing you heard when you walk in, into the county and you see you're going to work at the college, is how angry they were about that. They're still mad about that. Probably still are today. But anyway, they, uh, that was once, and we couldn't get another millage passed. We had the charter millage, and that was it, because the, the college was built. Now, the rationale for it was there were two counties just south of there, and both of those counties were rural counties, and they hoped that eventually they would vote to become part of the, the tax-paying district that would feed into the college. So they were trying to locate themselves kind of at a geographic center point between those colleges. So that was the rationale for why they did it. There is a kind of a funny story. When they actually got the 
ceremony with the, the shovels, you know, the silver shovels and the groundbreaking ceremony, they had to go across the street and ask some farmer if they could plug in to his barn so that they could get power for the microphones. <laughs> it was out there. But anyway, it, it became clear that this, this and, and also there was difficult times with the press. For some reason, and in my opinion, this was one of the best colleges I've ever seen, but it, it was not getting good press in the local press. So I don't know if it was the carryover from that or what it was, but it did not get good coverage, positive coverage very often. It needed, we needed an image uh, to be addressed. So our president called in a, a broad-based group, uh, including community members and board members and faculty and staff and all the other employee groups. And um, he called in uh, some other people who are marketing people. And we had basically a brainstorming session where we talked about various things that we could do. And each department kind of bandied up some things it could do to provide for the community for free. We had a building, somewhat like our building down here, a, a building that could be used for lots of different things, uh, gymnastics and aerobics and, and yoga and those things. So we offered to um, give that to the people who lived in the county at no charge. And so we put a lot of programs on. We had free concerts from Arts and Humanities. We had uh, uh, different things. And then we had one other thing that was a little unusual. In August every year, we had an antique car rally. And people really liked that antique car rally. And they came out in large numbers, and it was free to the people who were taxpayers in the county. So we noticed at the, at the rally that people loved the Corvettes. They would gather around those Corvettes. The biggest crowd was always at the Corvettes. The grass, the grass, people who fixed the grass told us they always had to put the Corvettes where they could manage the grass better because they were always ruined after the Corvettes were there because so many people were around. So our dean of instruction, who was kind of a renaissance person, decided that if we bought an old beat up Corvette every year and over the winter, and you couldn't do anything else in Michigan, you would restore the Corvette, restore the paint, restore the everything about the Corvette, except you couldn't restore the frame. If the frame was bent, we didn't buy it. But otherwise, everything else you could restore. So they worked on it, including the dean of instruction, got his you know, wrenches and, and stuff out. They didn't want me working on it. I would make it worse. But they had a lot of people who did work on it, and they restored it. It became a beautiful Corvette. Then, starting in April, they took it to antique car shows, to the Michigan International Speedway where they had crowds of 250,000 people coming for races and they raffled off that Corvette. And it was two bucks or three for five dollars and they, were, they made huge amounts of money. But the genius of it was they came back and they put that money, it's called Classics for Kids, they put that money into the sixth grade classes of all the high schools in the county. So if you were in sixth grade, they invested that money by the time you graduated from high school, you had two free years at Jackson Community College. So that did more for the image of Jackson Community College. The press gave it positive feedback. They could go out to the sixth grades every year and have a ceremony about how you're gonna have free tuition. And then when the people graduated in 12th grade, they had another ceremony and the parents loved it and everybody in all the schools. And, and they figured it out financially, they even had the accounting students working on the, on figuring out, uh, maybe not accounting, business students figuring out if they could uh, make it work, you know, and they gave them the raw numbers and they would see if they have enough money at the end to give each one free tuition. They had to figure some are going to go directly to the University of Michigan anyway, they're not going to come. So they figured out a ratio of how many students were going to use it. But it did more, that was a creative idea that emerged, and that's what I would say is my experience, is that if you can have something you can feed in and build a partnership with me and scholarships for kids so that every student gets something from the college, the college wins because it gets the students, it's a win-win situation, and it got a lot of positive um, feedback for our college, so that was my experience. Tell us a time when you took personal accountability for a conflict, failure, or problem and initiated a solution with an individual. OK. 
Okay, when I was uh, assistant dean in charge of distance education, uh, part of my job was to build a professional development program for the people who were going to be teaching online for the first time. And this was at, at Grand Valley State University. Actually, I did this first, and I did it a couple other places. But the particular situation I'm alluding to took place at Grand Valley State University. And <clears throat> university is a little different, but not a lot in this case. Uh, but I planned out the professional development activity, and I thought, this is a great time to make sure all of our classes have good instructional design. So I put instructional design into the training program. And they came to the training program, and I started off, and I could sense in the room, this isn't working. <laughs> you know, you have this sense that things are not going well. And it's just, I realized that fairly soon into it. And uh, so towards the end of the first session, there were three-hour sessions, I said, I can sense some tension in the air. What talk to me about what's going on. And they said, we don't want all this other stuff. We just want to know how to take our classes and use the technology. We don't want all this other stuff. And I said, well, here's the reasons for this other stuff. So they pushed, I pushed back. They pushed, I pushed back. And then I thought about Peter Singhees talking about when you find yourself in that kind of a situation where you're pushing and the people are pushing back and you're pushing back and it's time, you need to just say stop. We need to have a dialogue, we need to stop pushing, we need to say let's look at what's happening and more importantly, what am I doing to contribute to the problem? And I thought about that in the week between the two sessions. I thought what have I done to contribute to this problem? Because I didn't know if they were going to show up again the second week at this point. And I realized that the mistake I had made is I planned it alone. I planned it in my office. I didn't involve them and say, what is it you want out of this training program? What is it you want out of this professional development activity? What would be the most useful to you? And if I would have done that, I would have structured it much differently. So when we started the second session, I apologized to them, told them that I had made a mistake, asked for their help in planning it, and they were more than happy to help me plan it. And it became a different program than I would have planned, but certainly one that met their needs. Then I was able to do an instructional design one, but since it was labeled instructional design, the people who wanted that signed up for it, and that one went all right too. But the, the one called distance learning, try to slide the instructional design in with it, was a mistake. But I think the important thing was when I realized it, made, made the apology, and when I thought about what I had done to contribute to the problem. Question seven. Tell us how you have successfully led subordinates through change in the past and the steps you took to ensure a successful outcome. Well, as you can tell from my experiences, I've, I've led change quite often. And, uh, sometimes it's been in occupational education with the open entry, open exit. I've always been interested in educational innovation. You know, I did my dissertation on innovation, but I won't get into that. You'll be thankful for it. Um, anyway, the, uh, when I was putting distance learning in at Grand Valley State University, um, we found that there was, this was a substantial change. And especially, it, they were okay when we went to the telecourses. That was okay. Two-way interactive television was okay. But the third step onto online learning was a big jump for them. And the idea of moving to where you're dealing with people who are all over the place and online, in fact, the president would call me about once a month. He'd say, oh, does this online learning stuff really work? i say, it does, it really works. And I became convinced of that at Jackson when I was talking to my vice president. In the mid 80s, she took a course, an online course, and there were people all over the United States in her course. Hawaii, Florida, she was in Michigan. And she took the course and she said to me, you know, after the course, I felt like I knew the people better than if I would have been in the same room with them. Because I got to see how their minds worked. And that was very powerful then. I thought about that. And I thought, yes, if an instructor did ask the right questions, set up the right kinds of discussions, you could indeed see how the students' minds work. 
And so that was the kind of innovation that, that I was after, something that was very high level. But the people at Grand Valley were associating with a little less than. We're moving from the rich visual image of my lectures to a text-based um, series of activities, some of which you know just don't seem to lend themselves very well to text. So they, they viewed it as a step backwards. It's not quite as good as, you know, if you can't do it face to face, then we'll do it online. And I said, no, no, that's not the case. It's, some things are even done better online. And so the idea was, I could see that there was some work to be done to help them understand the relative advantage. So I went back to my old trick, site business. Now the good news about online is you don't have to go anywhere to do a site visit. You can do them online. And so I got some people I knew that were teaching exemplary online courses to let us log in and view their courses. And first we did it as a group, and we brought it up on a large screen, and we looked at some of the things that were happening. They began to see some of the quality of the constructivist learning that was happening. And when I say constructivist learning, I mean the learning was being constructed from the, from the discussion, from the dialogue among the students, and was at a higher level of thinking than you just read a textbook and answer multiple choice questions. So the learning was actually building through the course of the, the online process. So for the first time, they really began to see this as an innovation that had a true relative advantage that was going to be an improvement. So step one is people have to believe there's a reason to do it, a relative advantage to the innovation. Step two, they need the support system. And this is where I really struggled because I was director of distance education in a university it was not a high position. And the deans and provosts and vice presidents were not real anxious to provide all the support mechanisms that I said I needed in terms of learning management systems, in terms of training, in terms of orientation for students, in terms of um, all kinds of, of support, counselors that would work online, library programs that could be delivered online, all the support. So everything was like one step at a time, and it takes a lot of perseverance to take people through change. You have to be like a bulldog. It's, it requires tenacity. And so that's another thing I found out about innovation. The um, support systems were critical. In most cases, we got them in enough time. I remember one thing in Grand Valley, they you say uh, go to a larger two-way television bridge, and they did it one week before the semester started, and it was still be, it was still not working very well. So that was a disaster. I just didn't think I was going to live through that semester. Thought somebody was going to kill me because the technology kept breaking down. So you had to plan things far enough in advance, and you have to anticipate further for technological innovations than you do for some other kinds. So that's another thing that I learned that, in that experience. But eventually, you find your, your adapters and your people who are early majority and the ones who are innovators, and you go with the people who want to do it. You find the people who want to put a class online. I would never say to someone, you have to teach an online class. It is not gonna work, it's not a good idea. So you go with the people who want to do it, and you support them, and they'll spread the word for you. Especially if a couple of those people are what we call opinion leaders, and they're highly thought of by other faculty members, and you can use that as a springboard to get other people involved. So you use all those strategies, and you can make an innovation work in the school. Then you have to have the monitoring, the evaluation, the continuous improvement, the data collection, and things I've talked about before. So you, you have to build those steps in as well. It takes a lot of planning, and it takes a lot of, of uh, hard work and patience in helping people see exactly where it would benefit them and how they, they could benefit from doing it. Now, um, you mentioned you wouldn't have someone teach a class that didn't want to. How would you, if you had most of your students in the online program, how would you redistribute that? You know, if you had 200 students and 80 of them were um, on campus and the other 120 are off offline, 
How do you reapportion them? If they don't want to teach it, what do you tell that person? <laughs> well, words? you have to find an instructor for them, and it may, you may have to reach outside and do an adjunct instructor for a period of time until you can get full-time instructors who are willing to try it. But my experience is that faculty will, in fact, jump on board if they are asked and given the support that they need and assured that they'll be given that kind of support. Uh, I, I have not, in my experience here at LCCC, had trouble finding enough people to teach online courses. Maybe some departments have. I'm not saying they haven't, I'm just saying. In my experience, they can't. And I will say that many students prefer the online or want the online. When I taught at Valencia Community College in Orlando, my online classes filled up in one day. And the rest of them were three quarters full when registration ended in some cases. And it was because my students were teachers and they were so busy out teaching in K-12 and they were taking the extra 18 hours they had to keep their certification in Florida and they could take those in Florida from community colleges. So they were taking those extra hours. But yes, it was in demand. So what they did is they enlisted me to help other teachers understand the online. I'd invite them into my class. So they enlisted me because I was a proponent of it. So I would say, let's find the opinion leaders on the faculty who like it and have them work with somebody who's at this point skeptical or concerned they're not sure about it and let them work with them for a semester and then see if we can't uh, build uh, more people that way. But I do believe that people will be willing to do that. It is more time consuming and it is more work if you're gonna really do an online course right. But it also has some advantages you get to fix sometimes when you're going to be working on it and, and, uh, and that type of thing. And so, but I think the key is the support systems. Question eight. Describe one of the most difficult decisions that, you have, that you've had to make as your role as a leader. What would you do differently next time and what did you learn? Well, it probably won't surprise you when I say it was involved terminating an employee. Uh, who was a faculty member at a college. And it turned out, you know, I was hearing from other faculty members and from students that this person uh, did not have mastery of their content and would get halfway through a math problem and get lost and not be able to finish it on the board. And then I was also uh, hearing that uh, he was telling the people at uh, the local university that we had a program agreement that would transfer, so all of our credits would transfer, an articulation agreement, so all of our credits would transfer, and that wasn't true. So those were not good. <laughs> those were problems. And so I talked with them, and let me say that I realized where this could go early on. So every conversation I had, I was careful to document the conversation, followed up with an email to them, Ran it by our off-campus attorney. We didn't have an on-campus attorney at that time. Ran it by the attorney firm that we were using and got the president to let me email directly to the attorney firm so that any verbal or written communications I had with this person were in fact uh, documented and that the attorneys had cleared them so I wasn't making any errors. I'm not an attorney, but I wanted to make sure not to do that. And I told him that I was going to be visiting his class, and I went in and I did observe the behavior where he did get through, halfway through some things and couldn't finish the thought, couldn't finish the equation, couldn't finish the math problem, and the students were realizing that, so the credibility of the program was being lost. So I basically offered support at that point. I offered support and said, you've got to come up to speed in this. We will even work with you in some ways to get you up to speed. You can tell me the best way to do that, if it's taking a course at this university, if it's meeting with somebody because it's actually you can't wait for a whole semester. It's really best if you can meet somebody and get some tutoring in this. You've got to be up to speed on everything you're teaching in your curriculum. We'll worry about the, the parts you're not teaching later. But for the first part, you've got to be up to speed in those things that you're teaching and be able to carry these through. And essentially, you refuse to do that. And he refused my help and said, you can't come into my class anymore. I think I went in twice. And he didn't like the feedback that he was getting. So he told me I couldn't come in anymore. And so I said, well, then I have no choice. 
uh, by that time it was like one week from the end of the semester. I said at the end of the semester that will be it and I'll be in when you clear out your office because he had a lot of expensive equipment in his office. So I sat in when I cleared out his office and you just, sometimes you just have to do that. Sometimes that's just the way the world works. So that is never easy, but that's uh, a reality of the world we live in. Yes. Ask a quick question. When you have a situation like that, which is probably relatively correct, where the instructor really is not teaching material, the students don't have any faith that they've actually learned anything about the meaning and value of the course, you end up letting the instructor go. But did you have to do anything with any of the students to make it right with them? Yeah, we did. We had to, when we got the, a new person in, what we had to do was fill this new person in, and you're going to have to do some testing and entry levels of these students. And the ones that are already at, are ready for this class, you can go with the ones that are not ready, you're gonna to have to give them some alternative ways, to get up to speed so they're ready for the class. So we worked with this person's replacement to <coughs> tip that person off and to do the pre-testing and the upfront uh, analysis to make sure that these students were ready for the second class. So when they got to the second class, and that meant Sometimes that he had to end up run it as a two-track class to try to bring them together at the end. It was a challenge, and we gave him some extra compensation for that. But we did sit through that with him so he could run that dual track and give him help in designing that. Question nine. Tell us about an accomplishment you are most proud of personally and professionally. What made it so successful? I hear two different accomplishments, one personal and one professional there, two of them. Personal one, I'll just say that my kids still talk to me. Um, I guess I'm usually happy with that. No, I'm pleased about that. Debbie and I have raised the five kids to successful adulthood, that kind of way. And um, so that's a good thing. The professional, I thought about this question, I thought about talking about time when we brought Peter Singy to campus and there was a lot of hoopla. We had Meg Wheatley and we had a big deal and it was all exciting. But to tell you the truth, as I look back, I think my biggest accomplishment, I started teaching in 1969. I've never taken extra sick days and I always have tried to leave the place where I worked better at the end of the day than it was when I came in that morning. And, and I think I've done that. I've been reflective about it. I'm proud of the fact that I've reflected and asked myself truly what I liked about what I did that day, what I didn't like about what I did that day, and I tried to alter it. Somebody, uh, her name was Watson, I can't remember, Bernice Watson wrote in a, a magazine article one time, or a journal article, that the difference between a reflective teacher and a non-reflective teacher is the reflective teacher has 20 years of experience after 20 years, and the non-reflective teacher has one year of experience 20 times. And I think what I've tried to be is reflective and try to grow in the positions that I've been in so that I'm better at them in the second year than I was in the first and so on. So I think I'm most proud of the times when I've felt that I've done that. There's been times when I've not always been happy with my performance and, and I've tried to change those times. Question 10. If an employee came to you with a problem relating to another employee and nothing had been taken care of previously, how would you handle the situation? Okay, I guess it depends a little bit on what the problem is. If the person has committed a felony, <laughs> then obviously you need to get uh, other people involved. And, and uh, you have a, uh, an obligation and a requirement to do that, an ethical and legal requirement to do that. But if it's, if it's a an employee, two employees that are not getting along. I guess what I would encourage them to do is what I said I did earlier, is to step back and say to themselves, what did I contribute to the situation that we've ended up in? You know, did I contribute something to this so that we've ended up here? And can I stop doing that? And can we have a conversation where we bring that out for each other? And that would be what I would ask them to do. Um, I might take this time to mention that what I believe a president should have is a kind of a modified open door policy. 
where I do believe there are times when people do need to come in and talk to the president. I also think that they need to go through the uh, channels, the appropriate processes. Uh, so if it's a faculty member and they have not talked it over with their dean, I think they need to do that. If it's a student and they have not talked to the faculty member, there's a general agreement that deans will tell that student, you need to talk it over with the faculty member first before you come to me. And I think the same thing should apply in a president's situation, that they need to follow the appropriate process talk through the, with their dean, with the vice president, if that still hasn't been addressed to their satisfaction, they need to tell the dean and vice president that they are going to see the president, and then the president will talk to them at that point. So that everything's out in the open. I don't think people should be going behind back and go directly skipping steps and, um, and doing that. So that's, I know there's a little bit of a sidebar, but I think it is a part of that question and applied in that question. Is there anything you'd like to know about us? I think you know a lot about us already, about this school. Um, Do you have any questions for us Yeah, I don't about the position? Yes, uh, a couple of one is that uh, do you have a timeline on the position? Do you mean a timeline on when we'll choose or a timeline on how long they'll stay? How long the person will be in the position? Um, we talked about that a lot and we uh, ab after we fill this position we're going to start working on the permanent president. We are aware that we have a little bit of a timing issue because it's the spring or we're getting toward the spring. Right. And so a lot of folks who have what well, permanent president positions will already have them yes. to start that fall. And so we are aware of that problem. Um, we also want to make sure we take our time and get the right person. So even though we, we know we, we need to get it done, we also don't want to go too fast. We want to get the right person. So we've talked anywhere between six months to a year and a half. And would there be any contract or is it a Month by month. Month by month. Okay, so if the right person did come along in three months, and at least a house in the district for 12 months. I, I guess I'm not understanding. He's asking about a lease to live in. If I lease a oh, house in the district and I have a 12 I month lease. I would in say three months the perfect candidate see. walks through the door. Then we're not even going to start the process for probably okay. three months. Okay. Well, I'm sure we'll finish out this semester no problem. Okay. But it is a risky with Yeah. Yeah. It is a risky with because we are looking for someone month to month. It may work out to six months or twelve months or eight months. Okay. Yeah. I would say a minimum of six. Like a minimum of six. I can't imagine. Yeah. The other question I had was there's uh, a new council since I was here that exists, and I don't have a lot of details about it, but apparently it represents, uh, has representatives from the different uh, units of the campus. Yeah. College, College Council. council. Is that something that uh, will the president works with uh, directly? Uh, my understanding of college council is that the college council was formed by the president, by Dr. Hammond when he was here. Mm -hmm. And so the, I don't know if we've had a discussion about the future of college council. So I would... The president sits on the college council as an official. Authority is advisory. Well, I think I know most of the rest of the background of the college, and I really appreciate your having me here. Thank you. All right, everybody. Our public forum is going to start at four o'clock. The public forum with. Um, 
Howard Major. We're going to stick around here for a few minutes. So if you want to finish up your score sheets and hand them to a board member, it would be wonderful because there's not going to be any more formal interviews. <laughs>